Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I like to take science and apply it to all things plants. And this is a requested video from you guys to talk about cover cropping and specific types of cover crops and what each one is used for. So we're gonna get into the science behind them and kind of help you guys determine what cover crop works for you. Now, a lot of comments I do receive is, can I cover crop in a cold climate? And the answer is yes, it's gonna look different than that of a cover crop that may be in an area that has a growing season that is 365 days a year or even a longer just in general season so keep that in mind now cover cropping in a cold climate there are some prerequisites regardless of what form of crop you choose and one of the big ones is quick germination and very fast growth so you want to keep that in mind when determining which crops to go for now ways you can speed this entire process up would be doing a pre-soak in some lukewarm warm water overnight you could also use the instapot method where you set it on the yogurt setting and you actually warm the seeds up in a paper towel overnight or for a day or two and that in and of itself will yield it to sprout a bit quicker so there are ways around this that can help expedite just even crops in general so you may want to keep those in mind as the plants come off you want to start putting the cover crops in place so these tomatoes here here are very soon to come off you can kind of see they're falling over they're getting yellow things are really slowing down here and so three and we're a week and a half two weeks away from first frost and so those cover crops are going to go on ASAP now in some cases it may not work out in my favor especially if it gets very cold very fast and I am going to try to use as much as I can to my ability some frost resistant varieties but one thing I have been doing is as I've been pulling off things like the radishes and the carrots and the beets and the peas in these crops that were ready you know a month ago as I'm beginning to pull those off I was putting cover crops in place the other um, mindset you could use for this would be if you have an idea for a garden bed that you want to put in place and you want to grow in set it up now set it up in the fall put your compost in your soil in place and then cover crop that area rather than waiting till the spring where in that time's already insanely busy set the, the beds up now cover crop them get that rhizosphere working for you so next spring you're one growing season ahead because let's face it the roots on plants do very specific things they release exudates they get the microbes working and moving with that as well it helps with structure and all those things so if we can get a head start this fall on a garden bed we plan to do next spring i mean the the benefits are endless. So one really great place to actually get cover crop seeds is from West Coast Seeds. They sell these seeds in bulk. So there is just a ton of them in a pack. The packs are quite large. I'll insert some footage of what those look like. So it is one place to get those. And I'll leave a link down below to get to that. The other method you could use would be to use if in the case of um, dried goods. So if you can get dried, dried wheat berries or rye or barley barley or buckwheat or lentils, peas, chickpeas, that sort of thing, you can actually use the dried vegetables or the, the seeds from the store and plant those in the garden. Now, come keep in mind, they don't come with a germination rate or, you know, approvals and that sort of thing. So you're going to have to seed a heck of a lot more than you generally would if you were to purchase it from a seed retailer. But regardless, it works the same. So cover crops can be split up into three groups. The first one being legumes, the second one being fibrous grass, and the third being broad leaf non-legume. So that's kind of the three main categories. Now there is not much evidence to suggest that certain roots are, you know, better at, you know, providing or solubilizing certain nutrients. I know some people think that ryegrass is better at, you know, uh, solubilizing phosphate that sort of thing but the reality is is that that if it does happen is due to the exudates that those plants release which then encourage specific microbes to multiply and solubilize that phosphate so if that is kind of 
the mindset you're going for. You're looking for a specific nutrient release. There isn't just there really isn't much um, data to suggest that that's possible. Now, one thing you can do to actually make this possible is to actually use an inoculant. So my first cover cropping video I did here a few weeks ago that you know spurred this video, I did use an inoculant that had the iron solubilization, the phosphate solubilization, the nitrogen fixing. It had a wide range of different forms of fungi and bacteria that ultimately solubilize nutrients in the soil and make it bioavailable to the plant. So that would be the route I would encourage you to use first and foremost. I would choose one of the three groupings and then use that inoculant with those to actually get that boost to happen because there's nothing saying that, you know, is you know very inherently better than say a wheat and so because of that I would use I would encourage you to use an inoculant if that is ultimately your goal okay so the first one is fibrous root systems grasses so anything that is a monocot would fall under this category so if it looks like grass and it has a blade that is a fibrous root system regardless of what you're using so this can include wheat rye barley literally anything in the grass family all of these again will have the exact same result so don't get hung up on that we are looking at the root system that is what we're looking at when we're looking at cover cropping and the benefits to it so you want to choose a, a, a monocot a grass variety that is very quick to germinate and grows rapidly if you're looking for the benefits from that fibrous root system. So the number one hands down thing that a fibrous root system does is erosion protection. So if you have a brand new bed, if you have a sandy soil, if you have a clay soil that's very um, silty and tends to blow away, topsoil that blows away, this is the crop you want to use. That fibrous root system basically sends out glues and just glues the entire surface of that soil together. They don't necessarily go deep in the root system, but they are able to provide erosion protection in the spring when things begin to run off. It will prevent that as things dry out in the fall. It will prevent things from blowing away before the snow cover comes in. The benefits here are huge. The other case that we'd use a, a fibrous root system would be if you have a waterlogged soil, meaning a soil that tends to flood easily and chokes out or causes chlorosis in the spring. If we put a fibrous root system in place we can move that excess water out of the surface of that soil and try to dry it out as much as possible things like the broadleaf crops we're going to talk about and the legumes will not work in a logged waterlogged soil so this would be the case that you would use those in crosses just in general are known to solubilize a number of different nutrients from that soil but again that inoculant is just going to give it that extra push if that's what you're looking for specifically so new beds fibrous root system it's going to actually give your soil some structure and soils that tend to blow or wash away in the fall or springtime most definitely a fibrous root system will help one thing i will say with those crops is they tend not to just simply disintegrate once the snow hits or um, it dries out too much they tend to stay in place pretty darn good so because of and it's, that has to do with the root system as well and because of that it can act as a snow catcher and for some of you who are looking to grab as much natural water as possible this may be a benefit to you so leaving that crop in place standing up in the fall throughout the winter will help you capture more snow and ultimately more water but again if you have a waterlogged soil and you're just trying to remove that excess water here in the fall then i would not i would chop it down so you don't obviously end up with too much snow capture i find that with legume um, straw or just debris it tends to disintegrate pretty quickly in the fall time once things dry out and so because of that it's not as good as um, snow capture in general so the next one is legumes i don't think i have to you know go into great detail about these guys because i've talked about them so many times on this channel but legumes are anything that's a nitrogen fixer so this can be lentils chickpeas peas 
um, beans, you name it, anything in that legume family would apply here. And the literal main purpose of this is for nitrogen fixing. They're able to take N2 atmospheric nitrogen, which is the air we breathe, 78% of it is nitrogen, and it is able to fix it and then throw it back into that soil, which is huge. So if you're looking for a nitrogen boost in your soil, this is the place or this is the crop to do that with. Now, one thing I will say about this is if you have excess nitrogen or you fertilize throughout the year organically or otherwise, these bad boys aren't going to nitrogen fix for you. They're going to take the easy red out and they're going to take the bioavailable nitrogen out of that soil. So using a legume on a space that was used with sunflowers or corn or tomatoes, really heavy feeders is going to be the best um, benefit for you. I wouldn't necessarily put peas um, down in the spring and then cover crop with chickpeas in the fall. It just doesn't make sense. And so because of that, you would place these in areas that you had a heavy feeder the year before. Another thing that people don't talk about very often with the legumes is that they have a tap root system on them. They don't have a fibrous root system. So they're not particularly good at giving the soil structure or preventing against erosion or anything like that. But what they can do is drill down for water and then ultimately pull that water up into the profile. So if you are going through a drought year or your soil is looking a little bit dry in the fall, planting those tap roots will help pull that water up into the surface of the soil and ultimately give the plants in the spring hopefully more water in return. So that is something to keep in mind. They're also very good at breaking up compaction because of that taproot. So that taproot is really good at drilling down and fracturing the soil vertically and horizontally and ultimately um, allowing for more air movement through that soil profile. Now air movement through the soil profile obviously benefits the roots through the pro providing oxygen, but it actually also helps the microbes, in particular the macrofauna, the earthworms and beetles and centipedes and all that sort of stuff in there. And then also the microbes, so the really tiny guys that we can't see, the bacteria, um, the nematodes, that sort of thing. And so they provide oxygen to them, which ultimately makes your profile more biologically active throughout the entire system. I wouldn't use legumes in, uh, as a, a cover crop in any sort of no-dig garden where you're using compost, pure compost, and not working with soil. I just don't see the benefit there because you would have so much bioavailable nitrogen and your main focus when using the compost would actually be preventing erosion. And so because the compost in and of itself will wash away very easy, very, leach very easily, flavalize very easily. And so because of that, I would actually go more towards the grass cover cropping than the legumes. But we're dealing like clay, heavy compacted clay, and it's not waterlogged and it's actually pretty dry right now, legume it up and then leave everything in place for the fall. The last category is broad leaf, non-legume varieties. So I wrote down some versions of this down here because I would forget otherwise. The version I'm using this year for my garden because I'm going to be using the broad leaf um, cover cropping this year, I'm using buckwheat. And that one I did get from West Coast Seas. But this one, and the reason I chose buckwheat is because very quick germination and very quick growth. So if for whatever reason, it's like 40 degrees outside right now, Celsius, and so I'm dripping sweat. It's the end of, or no, it's September now and I'm dripping sweat. Our first frost is supposed to be September 17th. The nights are getting down to five degrees Celsius. I know, talk about temperature fluctuations in a day. Ugh, it's brutal but regardless because of that i want to try and get a cover crop in place and fingers crossed that that frost date somehow gets pushed back a bit farther if it doesn't ultimately it really doesn't matter but i have some new garden space that i'm trying to really get going and so that first crop getting just in place to get that rhizosphere active is going to be huge so broadleaf varieties can include brassicae species so this would be mustards um, canola if you wanted to i guess you technically could um and then um, obviously you know cabbage and that sort of stuff that wouldn't be considered a, a cover crop because the root density wouldn't be high enough you wouldn't be able to you know plant them close enough together radish turnip marigold golds and mustards you could also do like greens leafy greens in this case as well would work now if you're using radishes or turnips in particular 
the tillage radish this would be very specific for soil compaction similar to that of the legume because it has a giant taproot in it other than that it's not going to help too much with like erosion or um you know, you know soil structure and aggregation on a small scale but it is going to really plow in and get a ton of oxygen put into that system which ultimately down the road will help with structure and that sort of thing but it's something to keep in mind there to be honest the main purpose of a broad leaf cover crop is solely for removing excess nitrogen so if you had incredibly leggy growth this year or floppy leaves if you had a lot of pest issues flea beetles cucumber beetles um, disease that sort of thing kind of penetrating the leaves and damaging stuff because the leaves are too soft this is a sign you have too much nitrogen and i see this often so i'm going to refer back to the other youtuber here mind and soil I've been working or I had worked with him in the spring to kind of run an experiment on compost for soil and that sort of thing, which ones yielded the best. And one of the things he did do was um, a soil sample and I looked at it and he had a ton of nitrogen, like a shocking amount. And so I actually, I notice this all the time um, with people who do no dig. I can tell someone who's doing a no dig compost setup within 30 seconds of their soil test because they have so much compost, they have so much excess nitrogen. And so because of that, it leaves the plant leggy, um, very soft leaves, and that leaves it open to pest and disease and that sort of thing. So ultimately, if that's the scenario you're in, you may wanna use a broad leaf to help suck up that extra nitrogen. And then ultimately what you would do is you would just chop that crop down or leave it in place if you want it for snow capture. Then ultimately in the spring, you would remove it and then compost it and then all that end that was removed the excess end could then just be composted and reserved for later use not necessarily in the very near future these crops also have you know the uh, taproot systems on them so they're going to help prevent against erosion and oxygenation and that sort of thing but their main purpose is nitrogen absorption so they are very large plants typically speaking they um very stocky very firm so they need a lot of nitrogen to get going they're heavy feeders is another word that we like to use for those guys so that's that's their main purpose and it you know for people in no dig or someone who dumped on too much synthetic this year that would be a method for you to use so i hope you guys found this helpful i know this video is going to be incredibly long and i apologize for that but i will do another video on terminating a cover crop and specifically what is done there here in a little bit i'm going to wait though until the absolute last possible minute that my cover crop for mine can be terminated and keep in mind if you're looking for the benefits of the legumes combined with you know the erosion prevention factors of the fibrous root system then totally go with it do that it's in your best interest to do a double a version of that you don't have to monocrop it by any means the purpose of this is not to get a harvest the purpose is you're going to plant so many plants together that they're going to be competing for sunlight and going nuts the the purpose is not a harvest it is literally just to grow plants so double crop those bad boys together anyways i will talk to you guys next time bye